Welcome to the symposium Connecting and Rewilding Science and Practice. We're very pleased to have you all here today uh, in our little studio in Wageningen and you as an online community. My name is Lisbeth Bakker uh, and I will be a host today. I'm a senior scientist at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology and also a professor by special appointment at Wageningen University in Rewilding Ecology and that is a chair supported by Rewilding Europe. Today I'm not alone, we are co-hosting this event uh, and I will do that together with my colleague Raquel Filgueras. Good morning, my name is Raquel Filgueras. I'm head of Rewilding at Rewilding Europe. And with my other colleague, Frank van Langevelde. Good morning, my name is Frank van Langevelde. I'm professor and chair of the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So Raquel, Frank and me will together host this symposium today, but I will start with uh, the hosting for the first part of this symposium. So today we made a small studio here because we do an online symposium and we are here together in the studio, but of course um, you are not and you are alone be behind your computer probably since we have to do with all these uh, restrictions due to the COVID regulations. However, you can be sure that you are not really alone today because we were overwhelmed by the total amount of participants uh, that registered for the symposium. And I will show you actually uh, the amazing amount of these participants um, and where everybody comes from. So you can see now a map uh, where all people come from that registered for the symposium today. So there's people from 52 countries that participated and we have over 2000 participants that will attend the symposium or parts of it uh, and therefore learn about rewilding today. So we are really um, stunned by that, I must say, uh, and we are ex extremely pleased uh, to have you all with us. So we also ask you, uh, what is your background? Um, and we can see that we have people who come from a wide variety of backgrounds. So there's a lot of scientists. It's a symposium partly about science. And these scientists include a lot of students too. Uh, and we are really pleased about that as well because of course students are the future generation. Uh, and over time uh, you will need to take over from us. So welcome students also in this symposium. Then we have a fair share or a lot actually of nature enthusiasts. Maybe in the end everybody is a nature enthusiast in some way. Um, we have people from the non-profit sector, uh, which are also practitioners that actually uh, do nature management or some form of rewilding possibly. We have entrepreneurs, we have people from policy, uh, from the government, um, and also people who are somehow coming from another type of background. Um, and this survey was based on the almost 2,000 participants uh, where we had data from then. So uh, we actually really appreciate it because we believe rewilding is really a transdisciplinary um, science and that means it's scientific but also the practice is really important and it should actually be done by people from many backgrounds. So for the colleagues that not uh, attend today, we got a lot of emails from people who could not attend uh, and said please can we look at the symposium later. There's some good news about that too. The symposium will be recorded today and it will be later placed on YouTube so that people can actually look back to it. It will need a little bit of editing so you need to, to be a little bit patient uh, but a link will be placed for this uh, on the sites of Rewilding Europe, Wageningen University and the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, the three hosting organizations. Now, of course, it's more fun to attend today already. Uh, and to make this actually more fun, we have the live stream, and that is the way how you can be watching. But through the live stream, you cannot really interact with us. Uh, and that's why you have an app. And this app is made by Yellenge, which is the technical support organization that helps us through the day. Uh, and with this app, which you can download on your phone, um, and hopefully a lot of you have done that already um, because there's many multiple things you can do with that and the important thing for today is that you can ask actual questions so if you open the app it looks like this you have a menu in the top right uh, and there you can um, check out the program for instance um, you can also uh, look at the uh, profiles of uh, the different speakers that are there um, but also you can ask questions and we can briefly demonstrate uh, how this question part will work. So if you have a question, um, you look at uh, 
the program part where we are, so we are at the introduction at this moment, uh, and there will be an option to, to ask a question, as you see now in the screen. So you can just type your question and we will collect these questions and then after the presentation of speakers, we will answer those. But of course, if there's about 2,000 participants, you can already understand that we will not be able to address all the questions today. Um, so please forgive us for that. Um, so what you could do is that you could place an asterisk or a little star that you see in the lower part of the, of the question uh, screen. Uh, and if you press that, it means, hey, there's a question that actually I also would like to get an answer to. So if questions come in here that get many stars, then we know these are like frequently asked questions. And then we give those priority in answering them after the presentations. You cannot see the amount of stars that these questions get, but uh, be assured we can see it. So in that way, we can take that into account. And we will also uh, collect the questions um, after the symposium today. And we will look at the ones that are really frequently asked, but that we will not be able to address now. Um, and we will come back to that later through a Rewilding Europe newsletter uh, or and items on the site uh, where we can address the most frequently asked questions that are still out there. So in that way, even if your question is not addressed right now, today, um, if it's a one that many people have, uh, we will come back to it in some way. So it, it, it makes sense to ask questions because we will do something with it. Now the other thing that you see in the screen of the app is called a poll. So what we have during the day with each presentation we have actual questions uh, that we would like to ask you. Um, and with these polls, we ask you a question and you get multiple options um, for answers. Um, and we would like uh, this as a way to learn more about yeah, how you think about rewilding. Um, and also to share among the audience with all these different backgrounds, uh, how they perceive rewilding. So we can start to practice this, um, since we are working in this app now anyway, and you now know how it works. So please take your phone and look in the app and then look at this question because we will try one now already in the introduction. Um, and something that we are really curious about is why do you attend this symposium today? And we give you multiple options uh, that you can select from. And if you think my option is not there, there's even an option, other reasons that you can check. And what we will do is that you can vote so you can make your selection from now onwards um, and it will take a little bit of time before we get all the answers so please do your voting why do you attend this symposium today uh, and then in a few minutes i will come back to it to share with you what the results are so please take your time to do that voting now in the meantime uh, while we wait for the results to get in i will um, make a very short introduction why there is such an amazing momentum now for rewilding, which is also one of the incentives uh, to, to do this symposium today. As you are probably aware from several reports, uh, and in particular Living Planet report is a really important one, um, it's not going very well with wildlife and nature on the planet in general. So we have this uh, Living Planet Index, as it's called, uh, and that shows over time uh, how there is a decline in vertebrate animals, so the major part of wildlife, um, as, as an index value. So it starts in 1970, and then you see over time that there was almost 60% decline in vertebrate animals um, in general. And for me personally, that, that hits home, because I was born in 1973, and you see actually that this graphic depicts almost my entire lifetime, and it's not something that makes you... Uh, uh, you very pleased. Uh, this is a really sad development, obviously. Now, I'm also studying aquatic systems, and you see in there, in the freshwater habitats in particular, this trend of decline of vertebrate animals is even worse. So also, when we look at biodiversity in general, and at the global level, there are these famous graphics that you see over time again, from 1970 onwards, there's this steep decline in biodiversity. And there are different treaties and political assemblies that have tried to, to make to stop this and to make conventions how we can bend this curve as we speak. So how can we come from this decline to the upward situation that we can improve biodiversity? But so far it has not succeeded at all. So 
then why momentum for rewilding? Well, there is a lot to restore and there's a lot of initiatives now. So one of those at the national level in the Netherlands is the Dutch Delta Plan for Biodiversity Recovery, which aims to restore biodiversity in the Netherlands. At the European level, we have the European Green Deal, which is uh, becoming uh, taking action now. It's mainly about mitigating of climate change, uh, but that also uh, means there can be a lot of positive developments for biodiversity restoration as well. Then if we move to the global level, we have the UN Declaration of the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration from next year onwards. Well, that's uh, at our doorstep. That's almost uh, tomorrow, so to speak. And that means that they declared a decade that we should put very sincere efforts in restoring ecosystems worldwide. And they say that is because ecosystem restoration is fundamental to achieving sustainable development goals, and mainly those on climate change, poverty eradication, food security, and water and biodiversity conservation. So there's really a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of commitment from national to uh, continental to even global levels. And this is where rewilding could actually uh, be an approach that could be very useful to tackle these issues. So now we will move to the results of the poll, as they are in now. So what we can see in this, it's still uh, changing a bit, people are still, uh, still making up their opinion. Uh, we see that almost half of the audience uh, plans to learn more about rewilding. And the other half is, um, well, 40% of it to see whether they can become actively involved, involved in rewilding. Well, there's a lot of room for that. Um, and some people like to study it, um, get some inspiration. Um, and there is nobody who loves wildlife. <laughs> uh, but I think that is because they are already uh, voting for one of the other reasons. Um, so. I'm very sure we can learn about rewilding today. So in that way, I think you are at the right place. Um, and we're glad that this is also a main reason why you are here. Uh, and we will address later in the symposium also how you can actually be involved in rewilding more. So we will move on now and uh, actually get started with the first uh, session. And that's about rewilding, a new narrative in conservation. And first, I would like to start uh, in the very, at the very beginning. And that is, how, where are we now and how did we get there? And I think there is no one better who can actually explain that to us as Sir David Attenborough. Um, he is 93 years old now and he has taken time to look back at his life um, to really uh, tell from his own experience uh, how our planet has changed over time. And we will view with you a short video fragment um, that is part of his contemplation in light of the series Our Planet. Uh, and that's a collaboration between the World Wildlife Fund, Netflix, Netflix and uh, Silverback Films. Uh, and a predecessor of uh, uh, his, his latest film, Alive on Our Planet. Uh, and we will now view that fragment with you. So can we rewild the world? Well, yes, we think we can do that. And the central question that we want to address today in the symposium is how can we rewild the world? Today we will focus on Europe and we will also start at the beginning. What exactly is rewilding? How does it work? Where can it be done? And what does it deliver? And these are the central topics that we address today. But first we start with the narrative of rewilding. What is rewilding really? And we will start with a poll question for you, so please take your phone out and look at the presentation section of Paul Jepsen and there is a polling question for you. And the question is, is a narrative or a story behind what you do important for ecological restoration? And we give four different options that you can choose from that you agree with most. Um, and we would love to hear from you uh, through the voting in the app uh, what you think about this. And during the presentation, we will collect this information. And after the presentation, we will come back to the results of this poll. So you have some time to do your voting. And I would like to remind you also that after the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with Paul, the next speaker. Um, and you can, during the presentation, already ask your questions because that enables us to uh, select the questions that we will address after the presentation. 
So now I would like to introduce our first speaker. It's Paul Jepsen. And Paul is Nature Recovery Lead at the company EcoSulis in the UK. He recently brought out a book on rewilding. It's called Rewilding, the Radical New Science of Ecological Recovery. And he co-authored that with Kane Blight. Um, it's very fresh and it's a got a lot of very good reviews, so if you want to know more about rewilding, it's a highly recommended read. Uh, and also, by bringing out this book, Paul Jepsen seems the right person to ask, what exactly is rewilding? <clears throat> so Paul, I would like to welcome you at our rewilding symposium today. And I would like to invite you to go ahead with your presentation. Well, thanks, Elizabeth, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be uh, with you online, and uh, and wherever you are, greetings from a, a rather <laughs> rainy, um, a rainy Oxford. So, rewilding it's it's still um, quite a new term, and and every term has definition, it has meaning, and it has significance. And uh, well, us scientists or my scientific colleagues, we love to argue about what is re the definition of rewilding. But what I'd like to focus on uh, this morning is the, the significance. What is the significance of, you know, why we're here? Why this term rewilding has come to the fore in these first decades of the 21st century? And I'm going to argue that the significance of rewilding is that we're seeing, in rewilding, we're seeing the emergence of a new environmental narrative. And that is truly significant, in my view, and we'll see what you think of that as I, as I go along. So why do narratives uh, matter? I suspect quite a few of you have read uh, Sapiens, uh, the book Sapiens, so we'll, we'll sort of understand or have thought about this, this concept that as humans we, we live our lives through stories. That's what gives us our, our ability to, to act collectively. But narratives, narratives are sort of the architecture of these stories. They're what gives the stories a structure and a repeatability and they are the sort of ways we use to interpret events and the world around us. And I will say, when I, when I sort of started thinking about narratives, I went to the museum in Oxford, the Natural History Museum, and you can sort of see how that, the architecture of that museum, the way it's structured, it's structured into these components, you know, the, the dinosaur area, the fossil area, the comparative bird area, and so forth. And those are sort of fixed, but they, they give that, you can go into the museum and you can go with guides or yourself, and you can tell different stories, and you go around it in different ways, and the stories conclude. But that overall architecture is always there. So this is a concept of narrative, it's these components, the architectures in which we structure stories and they affect how we absorb and assign meaning to change and how we understand entities. They remind us of who we are um, and they also tell us of how things should or should not uh, be. And some narratives or many narratives have become part of our cultural DNA and they, you know, there's different cultures and different narratives in, around the world but there's some really thematic narratives which, which go through our cultural DNA. And these narratives, they, they, um, they sort of foreground the events which we think about or which we talk about. Uh, they give us purpose and meaning. They mobilize action. They organize governance. They give meaning to actions as well. And of course, you know, I think we're all very aware of this at the moment when we listen to the news and about COVID and the way that story is told and the way we've all you know, legitimated the actions we're, we're consciously uh, taking. But I think something which, um, which as scientists we, we do recognise and we increasingly need to recognise is that consciously otherwise, the narratives, the stories we tell of the world, the structuring we tell, actually uh, influences both the science we do and the policy responses to that science or interacted with that science. And then perhaps a little bit more philosophically, Narratives actually influence what we can become as humanity and what we can achieve as well as humanity. So these are narratives. And 50 years ago, Earth Day, April the 1st, 1970, it signified the arrival of a powerful environmental narrative. And an environmental narrative which I think all of us have lived our lives in and structured our actions and science uh, within. But interestingly, the sort of components, so that, that museum analogy again, the components of this narrative were already in place and they started being put in place with some really influential books, public, uh, you know, popular science environmentalist books just after World War II. Our Plundered Planet was, was mega at the time. 
And they created these three big components of it. The state of the planet, and Lisbeth started the presentation talking about the Living Planet Index, you know, it's not in a good way. The cause of, of why the planets or why nature's not in a good way, why natural resources are not in a good way. And <clears throat> the book in the middle, this was, a, this was the, the beginning of the population bomb, talking about, you know, the cause being human uh, fecundity expansion and so forth, and the consequences of that. And I'm sure many of you will have heard of Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, which gave... It took it to a different level, that part of the uh, narrative component, this sort of apocalyptic uh, type uh, consequence. So this narrative was, was around for, you know, as I say, from Second World War up until the 1970s. But by the 1970s, the, the physical manifestations of that narrative, they, they were there for all of us in, in uh, developed Western countries um, to, to see. I mean, you know, I grew up in Leeds and, and Manchester, and the rivers were polluted, uh, the cities were... Uh, um, you know, in a mess and so forth. Um, and this was taken up by a, a, a sort of the young sort of counterculture movement, well-educated, young generation, activist confidence. And what they did, and what they did brilliantly, is they populated that basic na na um, narrative structure with, with characters, with heroes, villains, and innocent victims. And I must say, the Greenpeace marketers at that time were just absolutely brilliant because they linked that environmental narrative with narratives in our cultural DNA. I mean, this image here is it's David and Goliath just being played out in environmental uh, activism. And the other key component then, that this was an activist narrative, it's there to pressure those in authority to act and to do the right, the right thing. And this is what has become the mainstream policy change narrative. And, you know, I'm sure we're all, well, we've all been living this in a sense with, with climate change, that we understand the state of the, the environment, you know, atmospheric climate pollution, the cause of it. And these are, you know, uh, different causes, sort of human greed, corporate greed, just not doing things well, devastation and so forth, things out of control. And the consequences of that, which, you know, we have now the, the nature emergency and the climate emergency. And then the process of this is that people pressure competent authorities, governments, corporations, international agencies to do the right thing and govern and regulate the perpetrators or the, the causes of that uh, poor state of the environment. Or they act to reduce the harm on the poor state of the environment. And when, when we think of the protected area movement, setting aside reserves to sort of out of harm's way, if you like, that's part of that narrative. And it underpins, you know, the narrative of the biodiversity crisis, the nature emergency, and our current climate uh, uh, crisis. And what I do want to really stress, because I'm going to go on to a different narrative, is that this, this narrative, it has achieved much. We wouldn't, you know, we'd be in a far worse state without it. And it's been the narrative which has put in our environmental legislation, uh, you know, our conventions and, and so forth. But this narrative uh, is, is also contributing to what many people are starting to call our age, the age of anxiety, the age of doom and gloom, and these constant reselling of stories of catastrophe, climate breakdown, nature emergency, is having psychological uh, impacts on, on all of us, on society, on people. Uh, on it. And, you know, you've seen these, these headlines now in the, in the newspapers and scientific articles, you know, the, the, the idea of eco-anxiety is becoming real, you know. I remember talking to some of my students and they're just saying, God, it's getting a bit too much, this, you know, that um, we've got all the worries of student debt, you know, getting on the job market, my goodness, can we, can we afford a house, you know, and we're going to deal with the climate crisis or the ecological crisis at the moment. So this this issue is, is, is becoming problematic. The narrative has achieved much, but it's also having these sort of anxiety effects which are starting to ripple through, I don't know, the mood, if you like, of, of society. And I, I felt this, um, you know, just a personal story here. Um, well, a couple of decades ago, in the 1990s, when I was, um, I was doing a lot of work on the, uh, on the Sumatran frontier, and, and I was doing my PhD at the time, and I was, I was really... You know, I, I, my, my, my area is governance and policy. And I came to realize that there was a fundamental flaw in that narrative in many countries, that the idea that competent authorities actually have the power to act and the power to affect change on the ground, I realized that it was 
it was just not there. Um, but there's almost this massive pretense, and we as an environmental movement were a little bit um, uh, part of that pretense. And, you know, I, I, I slipped into uh, a period of, you know, just loss of hope. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, all of this, what I've worked for, we just, you know, I don't know, it's just not working. Um, and I sometimes call these my OK computer days when I was just listening to Radiohead all the time, and those sort of wailing crescendos of Tom York. And I did write, I actually drafted this article on a, the back seat of a plane coming back from Indonesia, the most, you know, it's almost a cry for help, just like, just forget it, you know. We can't do anything to save uh, Indonesia's uh, lowland, lowlands forests. Um, maybe it was a bit of a midlife, midlife crisis uh, as well at the time. But then, I, you know, I was fortunate because I was directing, um, I was leading an MSc in, in, in Oxford. And interestingly, I think it was 2006, my students just turned around to me and said, look, we've just had enough of what you're teaching us. You're just teaching us doom and gloom. You know, we, what we, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to devote our careers to just sort of making a biodiversity crisis less worse. Yeah. What we want from you and what we want from Oxford University, actually, is we want the theories, the concepts, the science to equip us to build a new hope and ambition in conservation. And they're quite lovely sense. I mean, I'm reminded of this. It was almost they just said, look, okay, your generation, you've just done your best, but we'll take it from here. Um, thanks. You know, just, just give us the, the frameworks to think and to innovate and we'll go for it. And at that time, I, I came across this really intriguing articles about what was going on in the Dutch Delta. And this quite novel approach to European nature conservation at the time. I started to tell this quite different story about, you know, herds of, herb, herb, herds of large herbivores roving through landscapes, creating the conditions for nature uh, to, to flourish. So I said to my students, I said, come on, then. so we just hired a couple of uh, minibuses and uh, I went to the Netherlands to uh, meet with the uh, progressive practitioners uh, of the time. And actually, over a number of years, we, we did many field trips um, uh, to, to the Netherlands. And these were just uh, amazing. I mean, you know, meeting with, with, with Franz Vera at the, at the OVP. And, and just Franz is, I mean, I, I think he's online here. And I, I have huge respect for Franz because his, his talent for inductive reasoning and to unsettle the dogma which we've almost the ecological dogma which we've been caught up with and, cr and create this new narrative i mean just this different way uh, of thinking of it and exposing circular reasoning in, you know in, in in our science a huge challenge but a challenge with vision as well and then uh, meeting people like young Beekhouse uh, down at the milling board who was doing this sort of softer more entrepreneurial form of uh, of rewilding and, and just showing those links between enterprise and, and uh, nature recovery. And then, um, I mean, we visited some of the eco ducts under construction in the Netherlands. It's just this idea that you could put nature infrastructure in, in place across a, across a nation. Um, I have to say, these, these trips were perhaps some of the intellectual highlights um, of, my, um, of my teaching uh, in Oxford. And I mean, it was, it was unbelievable just seeing students just sort of jaws dropping and just sort of peeling off from these discussions and sort of, God, what, you know, what is going on? Then coming back for more and just, yeah, awakening and settling to, to new ways uh, of, uh, of new ways of, um, of thinking. And of course, these, these, I mean, I think one of the really exciting things and really the topic of this symposium, this is interplay between the science of the academy, the deductive science of the academy, and the inductive science of you know, really gifted ecologists working uh, in the field. And, you know, in Oxford, amongst my colleagues and some of the labs, this is really sort of, you know, sort of challenged and settled, revitalized uh, a lot of the research which was going on. But there was an interplay because there's, you know, real, really sort of new thinking in long-term ecology, functional ecology, earth system science, and coming together with this practice. And I think it's really fitting that um, this was professorship is in the Netherlands, because I think the Netherlands is where this new synthesis has started coming together, and which both the new science and the new narrative of rewilding has come, is coming together. And then over the, if you like, over the, over the years of teaching and researching rewilding, I was really lucky to, to visit and meet um, you know, these sort of pioneering practitioners from from all, all over Europe and, and actually in, in different parts of the world. And I, I started becoming struck how they were, they were telling quite different stories to what, you know, what I'd grown up with, if you like, what I'd been doing in my profession and what I'd heard others doing. 
And I started really realizing that there were some, if you like, common themes to these, some common sort of narrative components. They all started with rethinking. You know, Franz Beer again, sort of looking at grazing geese and just rethinking what was going on with ecological succession. Then they start, then there's always this story of, of them just saying, like, I'm not waiting for the authorities to act, I'm not going to pressure, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to begin. And starting small and big, uh, building up. There's always stories about how through this process they've been re-evaluating things them, themselves as what, as, as, what, as what they should be doing or what uh, nature and nature conservation could achieve. And then one of the brilliant things, you know, reflecting back to that state I was in in Sumatra, is that these people, they were always fired up. They were enthusiastic, they were passionate, they found meaning, uh, and there was, you know, nature uh, was, was recovering. And in the summer of 2017, I decided to sort of, well, to do, just make sense of this, what was going on. There seemed to be a tension with the these classic environmental narrative and, and what, I was, um, what I was hearing and what I was reading and what I was writing about um, uh, as well. And one morning I, morning, I just woke up and said, this is a narrative of recovery. And I um, sort of bombed into the university on my bike and started, you know, searching for narrative of recovery on the academic, um, you know, search engines. And these, these papers came up from, uh, from the field of mental health and talking to me about the accounts that people tell of recovering from mental health. And reading these carefully and with what I was hearing from uh, rewilding practitioners, I realized that actually what we're seeing is a new structure in, in rewilding. I mean, this is a suggestion, it's not, you know, that it starts off with this, this state, you know, this sort of sense of despair about the state of the world. But then there's always this component about, about awakening, people telling stories about how they've reevaluated, they've just thought about things differently. Something's triggered that. Meet, you know, us going to the Netherlands or something else. And then this independent action, sort of saying, right, I'm going to do something, or I'm going to join others who are doing something, not waiting and not trying to, you know, that anxiety or that frustration of, of those in, pushing those in power to act. But then through this process of acting, sort of iterative process of, of a change in their own attitudes and expectations and expectations of what nature can do, and this process of rethinking and assessment going on, and then refinding wellness, both wellness for themselves, but wellness in nature as well. So this is my suggestion, is that actually what, what we're seeing in, in rewilding is this new narrative structure and a new uh, environmental narrative uh, starting to emerge. And just very briefly, because I know my time is running short here, I think there's another aspect to this, and I think you're going to hear this much more in the next presentation by France, is that aligning with this narrative, and you know, again, I'd really like to say thanks to Wouter Helmer here, as well as Franz Sheppers, for the, the times they spent with me in, in talking about the, this emerging action uh, philosophy, which is associated with this. And it's a very pragmatic action philosophy. You know, we are where we are. There's no point feeling guilt. So let's just begin, but begin well with visions. And let's remember that nature in itself is a force. If we take our foot off it, it will bounce back. And we can work with that force of nature and sort of link it with the forces of society and economy to shape a better future for all, nature and people. But crucially, we need to embrace uncertainty and we need to process, you know, embrace processes of becoming. Things will unfold and in that is the surprise and we need the confidence uh, to, to embrace and, and, uh, and do rewilding. So just to conclude, there's another really nice book, which I read, well, I don't know if it's a nice book, but an interesting book I read on, on marketing and, and this idea that stories and narratives, the stories and narratives we use will, will win the future. And that the dominant, the dominant environmental uh, narrative, the one we've grown up, it aligns with the anxiety marketing. It's all about appealing pe to people and societies and governments to do the right thing to avoid undesirable actions. Mm -hmm. And it's needed. But the emerging recoverable earth narrative aligns much more with what's called empowerment marketing, which is invitations to act individually and collectively and to, to create well wellness on this. And I suggest that we need both narratives, but I suggest that the 21st century narrative and what rewilding is offering is about empowerment. So rewilding and the recoverable earth narrative, I think it, it, it's an opportunity or what it's already doing. It's providing our conservation movement and maybe our society at large with new hope, new confidence and a new ambition and spirit uh, for the century. We can recover nature, we can recover uh, our own wellness, uh, if you if you like. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, that was a uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we did receive uh, a lot of questions, of course, I would say, during your uh, presentations. So I would like uh, to start a question and answer session with you uh, and ask you a number of these. So we start with the first one. And that is, what is one thing that an individual can do that would have a meaningful impact in helping the environment? Well, if I was, if I was to pick up on, on this theme, I think it would be just to start telling these stories of hope and starting, you know, uh, sharing with people that there are stories of nature recovery around um, and that, you know, we, we can recover nature, that, that although nature is at a low ebb, it will bounce back with, um, uh, um, you know, with, uh, with, a more, with a more positive attitude and with, uh, with re rewilding. It's a little bit hard to say what, what every individual can do, but every individual is different. But I think that point of just starting to do something and, you know, yeah, just, just do whatever you can do in whatever capacity, um, whatever capacity you have, because I think we know that nature is a system and we also know that society is a system and, you know, it, it, it's not going to be one person who saves it. It's just going to be all of us working together in our own small or big ways to bring about change. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next question is whether you have any suggestions on how to approach a landowner who is not yet aware or interested in rewilding and how then to get them engaged. And the person who asked a question is, is thinking of someone who owns uh, much of uh, their valley and rents some of it for woodcutting and to hunters clubs, uh, but the rest is sort of wild but not protected. So how could you get this landowner uh, engaged in tour rewilding? I think the first thing I'd have to say is, I think it's everything. You, you've got to understand land from a landowner's perspective. And, uh, you know, land is an asset. An asset has to, those assets have to generate value um, in different forms and maybe passed on. So, you know, it's, I mean, I, I really like the, the rewilding Europe ethos, which is, which is, you know, leading with visions and inv invitations to join, but but never, not really pressuring people in the in the in the same way as perhaps the the old environmental narrative uh, did. Um, I, I, you know, I think we'll talk about this perhaps more in the symposium that rewilding mm -hmm. needs land, um, and you know, and, and that's the biggest challenge really is, is finding ways to, um, uh, you know, to to build a, a land economy based on. You know, nature recovery and nature-based enterprises. So I'm afraid I don't have a, um, a uh, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, an easy answer to that. But I think it's part of the, um, of, you know, of the narrative. And I think, you know, I'd look at Scotland, the big picture, which has been doing these, going around, um, you know, theatres in, in regional theatres and, and telling these new stories of what, of what, you know, what Scotland could become in that case. And, um, you know, people turn up to those, landowners turn up to those and, you know, people need time to reflect and, you know, have that awakening and have that reevaluation and starting to think about what they do, might do. So I think the, yeah, I think it needs, it needs to be led with vision and you need to take a bit of time and you need to understand the perspective of, of landowners and other people and you know, co-design and co-produce those. Yeah, sure. So um, there's a new question about another uh, overwhelming negative narrative, uh, and that is uh, with regard to invasive species, um, which indeed I would say is a, is a very good example. Uh, what do you think about this as a, as a negative narrative? Yeah, this is a really interesting one because, you know, when you think actually of some of the narratives we use in conservation, some of the words we use in conservation, like invasive, you know, alien, non-native. These terms are a little bit out of sync with our multicultural societies uh, at the moment. And there is no doubt that uh, some species can become invasive and have negative ecosystem effects. But I quite like the, the idea of, of rewilding and the notion of novel uh, ecosystems where when we're rebuilding, so we might, you know, bearing in mind that our European ecosystems, a lot of them are really quite badly degraded. They're sort of flat in the sense as we rebuild them, you know, invasive species or, you know, non-native species may just become part of those novel ecosystems. 
or they may be caught in balance by um, ecosystems. So actually, I think we, we sort of need to rethink the notion of um, uh, invasives a little bit. And when we do start to think, rethink about that, I mean, there's a number of, you know, quite a, I mean, when I think of the natural history of, uh, you know, Oxford, there are, you know, non-native species are part of that um, uh, now. So again, sorry if that sounds a like waffle, but I, I think that, um, you know, we, we do need to real, realize that some invasive species are, are problematic, but actually rewilding is giving some really novel approaches to how we might um, respond to uh, invasive species. Yeah, that would also refer to the forward-looking uh, aspects of rewilding, I guess. Um, so there's another question, uh, uh, and this person says, you talk about narratives to engage people in rewilding, um, but what about narratives of rewilding and conservation that may exclude local people from the lands they once lived in and the way they used it? Um, and there could be examples of this. Um, it says from crofters in Scotland to the Amazon rainforest uh, and others. Yeah, so that's interesting. So th this is a social science narrative and it, it had the label fortress conservation. And it, it sort of created this impression that um, conservation was in somehow pushing people um, off land. And there are cases of that historically and, and other, you know, you know, other agendas have, have aligned with, with nature conservation. Uh, sorry, with, yeah, with nature conservation. What I haven't seen, and, I, and in fact, the challenge I will put back to people who feel that narrative is that there isn't that, I mean, with rewilding, I don't know, just conservation just doesn't sort of work in this way um, uh, anymore. I mean, it doesn't have the, the, the power to do that, and I don't think many conservationists even want um, to, to do that. Um, and there's some good lessons which have been learned. So I would slightly reject the claim that, um, that rewilding is about pushing people off the land. I mean, as I just mentioned, that the, so certainly the European philosophy or ancient philosophy is, is to say, look, we've got some new ideas, we've got some new approaches, um, there's a new way of, um, you know, a new approach to land economy. We're really happy to share those with you, and if you'd like to sort of, you know, these sort of invitations to action, rather than pushing anybody um, uh, off the off their land. I just, I just haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the world is complex and there's many different versions of, of conservation and it may happen, uh, may happen in some places. Yeah, I think also we come back to this, uh, this topic in the symposium in, in several of the sessions that we have. Um, so here's a new one. Rewilding offers a new narrative for conservation, one of recovery and restoration. Yet there seems to be another narrative it has become associated with, that of urban versus rural, or left versus right. And what can the rewilding movement do to avert this sort of polarization? I don't think you can. I think that when any new, I mean, rewilding is starting to, you know, I mean, I'm only suggesting that rewilding signifies this narrative. But rewilding is coming to signify that. And, you know, when any, you know, when any new, thing emerges in society, it just gets, it can get aligned with politics. And unfortunately, our media really likes to, you know, that's, you know, they really like to, you know, they always have this narrative of conflict uh, on it. And also, I think we have to recognise that at the moment, our society is, you know, European society, particularly in the UK with Brexit and everything, we're, we're quite divided societies and we're quite bickering uh, with, with each other. So I don't think that rewilding can avoid uh, that. I think it's just about always, you know, talking about what rewilding is about, and um, and not aligning with any, with any political um, thing. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you know, the recovery of planetary systems, the recovery of wellness. Surely that's what we all want. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it does not have a political flavor uh, in that way. You would uh, you would say. Um, then there's another question. Is it better to rewild in a certain order? So, for instance, start with pollinators or key insects or just keystone mammals like European bison or beavers? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I have to say, I think that's, um, you know, my area is, is although I'm eco ecologically trained, my area is more on the policy and governance. So I think that's a question, <laughs> you know, good on some of the, uh, the, the, other, the other speakers. But th this, this idea about what order do you, do you rewild in? That's a, it's a cracker. It's a really active um, area of thinking, and a lot of it is, is um, depends on what the 
what the starting conditions are. Um, so again, you know, every rewilding um, project is, uh, is bespoke. But I think what we do know is that we need to start with, with vision and stories of vision and you know, bringing people on board and you know, uh, enable people to, enabling different stakeholders I think call them that, to, to co-design the, the rewilding vision so that there's a process before you actually, if you like, start to, start to do the ecology piece. Yeah, we will also uh, come back to the keystone mammals uh, in the, in a session immediately after the lunch, so then maybe we can we can ask this again to uh, Jens Christian Svenning by then. Um, so then uh, I would like to um, turn with you to the poll and to see um, what people answered about uh, the narratives. So. The question was, uh, is a narrative or story behind what you do important for ecological restoration? Well, there's an overwhelming uh, majority uh, that says yes. Uh, with a narrative, you can engage other people in your restoration effort. It's uh, almost 80% says this, uh, or at least agrees with this statement, so to speak. Uh, there's an other yes, um, almost 18% uh, that say I agree with the a proposition that a narrative gives guidance to how to perform restoration efforts. Um, and a, a few people uh, voted for no, a narrative is not, not needed. Uh, and they could choose between the options that there are already laws that tell us what to do and protect nature, such as Natura 2000. Um, but also, um, there are some votes that we mainly would need quantitative data, um, such as we can obtain from monitoring. Um, but essentially, I think the majority of the people seems to agree that the narrative is important. Would that also um, align with your experience, uh, Paul, since you know uh, or you pay attention to these narratives uh, and you work a lot with, uh, with ecosystem restoration? Do people indeed uh, use narratives to engage other people? Well, I, I, believe, that, I believe that we do. And, um, and it's interesting, um, but I think sometimes we, we you know, the question is whether we consciously or, or subconsciously use narratives. Um, I believe we all do use narratives. And maybe what I you know, hope I've sort of suggested in, in, um, in this presentation, it's, uh, it's worth reflecting on those and actually uh, becoming more aware of them, perhaps, and, and just thinking about, you know, what narratives work and what narrative work, narratives work in, um, in, in different places. I mean, my mm -hmm. experience is that the, um, if you like, the anxiety, the doom, you know, the, the classic environmental narrative, it works really well when you when you're dealing with um, with politicians or with leaders. but um, the more empowerment you know the rewilding narrative it, it just seems to work better with with regular people actually because you know it's more at the scale of their lives and more um, uh, you, know, you know more something you can be you can some something you can be part of um, so I do believe that narratives uh, narratives matter yeah uh, of course, but uh, the, the, in, in a way, uh, you're not alone. So many people do believe that. Would, would you maybe think also that there uh, may be some sort of a division that um, students, for example, or younger people, you, you showed that you go around uh, with students during courses to these type of rewilding projects. Would they be more uh, interested in, in what sort of narrative uh, belongs to, to what they want to do than possibly uh, people that are longer time also on the stuck in the job, so to speak, uh, and maybe have lost a little bit of this uh, this type of interest. Yeah, I, I, maybe I could answer that in a slightly different way. I mean, I'm really glad you raised that question because I think what I was putting out here is that this suggestion that in rewilding we're seeing the emergence of a of a new 21st century environmental narrative. I don't, and you know, these different components. I don't think that's settled yet, and I think. You know, I think it's really for young people to shape that narrative, um, you know, and uh, and develop that narrative. And I think, you know, what an amazing time to be, uh, in a sense, where you can be part of shaping a new narrative for the, for the 21st century. And, you know, I was, you know, you know I was, um, uh, you know, I was a student in 1980, and, and I was part of, in a sense, shaping the delivery of that, that old environmental narrative. Um, and then it settled down and there was this period of stability. So I think there's a real opportunity well, for all of us, but, but students in particular, because they, they, they're there with the cultural vibe. They can make this connection between, you know, <laughs> the, 
if you like, the, the conservation rewilding narrative and the narratives that they're part of in, in modern society and, you know, which I'm probably a bit out of touch with. So, um, you know, I think there's an opportunity to, to shape this, this new conservation narrative. Yeah, and at the same time, um, um, of course, uh, well, it, it seems uh, people appreciate a, a narrative in, uh, in what they are doing in terms of, uh, of ecosystem restoration. But that would, of course, not necessarily mean that, that uh, laws and regulations as Natura 2000 uh, or quantitative data are, are not relevant anymore, right? Okay, so one of the big problems we have, I, I would argue that um, the science and narratives underpinning Natura 2000 are 50 years out of date. So the question going ahead is, do we keep, do we, you know, I mean, this is one of the biggest questions. Do we go on with the science and narratives of 1970 into a world of 2015, 60, which is going to be totally different from 1970? It's already totally different on, on it. And it's a real tricky one because the, you know, that narrative created strong law, but actually some of that law isn't really supportive of rewilding. So I'm very much arguing for a process of um, institutional you know, transformation and redesign. And, um, you know, we, we transformed the, the, the International Institutions of Conservation in the 1970s. We built them up and it's time to redo that with a new narrative and a new science um, going ahead into the 21st century. Um, I mean, I can't think of any other sector of society where we are going ahead with laws based on the science philosophies and narratives of 1970. Yeah. So um, you already talked a bit about your own, uh, yeah, how do I say it, maybe a awakening moment uh, when you uh, were seeing doom and gloom in the Indonesian uh, forest. Um, you yourself in your career, you moved from practice to science and back again uh, to practice also. Um, do you feel that your experience in practice has strengthened your science and the other way around? Well, it's interesting, you know, are they, so I, I'll put it slightly different, actually, Elizabeth. I said I moved from practice to the academy, back to practice. So I think we have to realise that science is not only done in universities and research institutions. And, you know, I think this is one of the, one of the messages. Uh, the reason I moved back into practice is because so much is going on at the moment. And sometimes the science, you know, in the academies, we're a bit distanced from that. Um, and, and sometimes we're just commentators. And, you know, as I mentioned, my, my real interest is, is policy and governance and, and the, the value of going back into practice, I think, is twofold. One is that it gets you right back into the hard realities of bringing about change. Uh, and, and that is really fascinating. And, you know, so in, some, in terms of my policy science, I'm learning all the time by actually, try, you know, actually working at that complexity of the interface between you know, people and land, if you like, or policy um, and, uh, and land. Okay. But I think there's another reason I moved back into practice, because I believe that rewilding and the new conservation of the 21st century has to, it, 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 you know, the, the conservation of the 1970s was in big government, where governments may, through public money, put aside reserves or whatever. You know, that is going now, that if we're going to rewild and restore at scale, we have to generate a new land economy. And that land economy is going to, the commercial sector is, is inevitably involved in that. And we need to be designing that new rewilding uh, involving the commercial sector uh, as well as the NGO and as well as the science sector. So, um, and, and again, you know, that, that's, if you like, where my policy science is was of interest, how we, you know, how, how those things come together. Yeah, I see. I, I do agree that uh, there's uh, science going on uh, outside of the immediate uh, academic institutions. Uh, so I like that you comment on that. Um, most people uh, are not so versatile uh, as you in their careers, uh, and they are either in academia or in practice. Um, and do you have suggestions as how how they can work together and team up uh, to yeah take this rewilding movement further? both from the scientific and practical side? Well, it's interesting, right? Because I think, you know, if I just base, based on my experience, um, I think the value of investing in demonstration projects, these pioneer projects, which, you know, you guys in the Netherlands have been absolutely brilliant at this. And as soon as you have these, 
you know, spaces of nature innovation, physical spaces of nature innovation. People come together there. And I think it is, you know, when people are walking around these sites, you know, th these, are, these are the sort of melting points, I think, of, of science and practitioners and commercial and, and policy. And you, you, you know, there's something about when you're talking about ideas in nature with people who are passionate, that's where we get the, 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 the connections. So I think there's big opportunities for that coming together you're talking about. But I think we need these, you know, the more and more of these demonstration sites or pioneer sites, whatever we want to call them, rewilding sites, uh, to, to, to make those connections and, and those flows of, of insight, science, you know, pragmatic, practical understanding between the different groups. Yeah, that, that, that would also be my experience. If you meet each other in, in, in the field, so to speak, or, or in a um, model situation where you can actually uh, uh, meet uh, based on, on the interest that you have uh, in a mutual way, uh, then this is a great start for cooperation. Um, I realise we're a bit desperate for this as well, as we're all sort of you know, locked down in different levels. Yes, um, that is exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, we're longing for these uh, moments to yeah, happen yeah. again. Um, you are also rather unique in that you combine uh, the social sciences with eco-technology in your career. Um, and when we think of rewilding, often people think of wildlife or ecology or biodiversity. Uh, but in your presentation you show, uh, and also you mentioned it several times now already, that there are more dimensions to rewilding, uh, such as the narratives in conservation and restoration. Um, would you characterize rewilding, therefore, as a, as a multi- or transdisciplinary field? Uh, absolutely. So I, I sometimes think that rewilding, um, you, you know, it embodies advances in transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary um, uh, conservation. Uh, and and what, what uh, sciences or expertises uh, do you think uh, could or should participate in these uh, rewilding efforts and studies? Well, I, I think, you know, if we're taking a future-looking view on it, it and, and this idea that, you know, the narratives and forces which will shape the future and the idea of linking, you know, the recovering forces of nature with other forces in society, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that, that technology is one of the forces which is shaping the future. And I really do think we need to think more about how we can um, create an interface between advances in technology mm -hmm. and rewilding, and this is... What we're doing at Eco, Eco Sulis and and sort of co-design it. I mean, you know, there's this massive issue on um, which I think we're going to talk about la later on. How do we how do we measure rewilding success and the value that rewilding generates for both the nature, society, and, and economy? And and that's going to need a whole set of new science. And that new science is, you know, it's going to be at the interface of of sensors, data science, AI, and, and technology. So I think something that rewilding hasn't really, uh, it's starting, but it really needs to um, engage with more is advances in um, broadly in, you know, in technology. Yeah, that's uh, for uh, the students who are listening, I would say pay attention uh, because uh, this will give ample opportunities for uh, really exciting studies in the future. Really exciting. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, we really appreciate your contribution. Mm -hmm.